Chat with Traders, episode 13. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. Hey, what's happening? It's really great to have you tuned in to a brand new episode of Chat with Traders. This week, our guest on the show has upwards of 15 years in the game, so we had no shortage of deep trading knowledge to reflect on for our interview. Let me introduce you to Lance Beggs, a price action trader that is a little different to most. While he still relies on technicals to a certain degree, his edge comes from the ability to adapt the mindset of other participants and gauge entries based on their fear. Lance refers to this as the meta game, which he breaks down in much more detail during the interview. Lance also goes into how he controls tight stops and uses an aggressive risk management strategy to trade successfully. This segment also includes some great tips on how to nail the re-entry that many traders struggle with, mainly due to the psychology reasons. Also, Lance will be keeping a close eye on the comments for this episode, so go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash Lance and leave a question in the comments that you would like him to answer. All right, guys, enjoy this week's episode with Lance Beggs. Here it is. Hey, Lance, how's it going? Yeah, really good, Aaron. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for the invite. No, no, I'm stoked to have you on. It's, um, I know you had to juggle uh, a few times around to make this this fit in with your schedule, but um, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, like I mentioned uh, when we were talking before, I spent a lot of time on your blog yesterday and I found it very insightful. You have so much great content on there and I especially like how you take some of your readers' questions and turn them into like detailed blog articles. I found that really cool. Oh, it, man, that is awesome. You know, I, I've been up for about two hours and you've made my day already. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're off to a good start. So no, I'm really glad you got some value out of uh, reading through the blog. So thank you. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So let's, um, let's start this off by telling us how you got into the field of trading, because I believe you were a military pilot in a previous career. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's correct. Um, what, what appealed to me with training and what really attracts me to this business is not so much the money, not so much the uh, the large incomes that it can provide, but rather the freedom to set your own, to, to live according to my plans and not be subject to someone else's agenda. That is what I really love about this business. Um, how I got into trading, the short story is I was in a job that I absolutely hated. Uh, it was just a frustrating, mind-numbing, soul-crushing experience day after day. And I think a lot of people go through similar stuff. I mean, you look at them on the commute to work each day and uh, uh, I think, yeah, a lot of people are stressed and depressed. And uh, yeah, that was me. And yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people have trouble relating to that because to be honest, I had a job that I think a lot of people think is like the dream job. I was a military pilot. I flew helicopters for the army. Um, but, you know, really you do any job for several years and when you're only flying for about 200 hours a year, that's a whole lot of hours just to be stuck in the frustrating bureaucracy of uh, a large organisation like that. And I was just not suited to that environment. I needed some change. I needed something different. Um, so that's really the short story. How I got here is uh, I just hated my job. Um, the process of that leading to trading is a much is a bit longer story it wasn't a, an immediate sort of hey i hate flying let's go and trade it was it's a bit of a longer roundabout process do you want me to go into that yeah yeah so let's go into that so maybe sort of talk about um where you actually got started once you decided that you wanted to sort of um move in the direction of trading yeah, initially it was a roundabout process because I didn't discover trading till I was about 30 years old. I had absolutely uh, almost zero exposure to it. Uh, my parents aren't involved in the industry. My friends' parents weren't. None of my friends did economics or markets uh, trading or anything like that. I just, I really just almost did not know it existed with the exception of a about a 10-week period where I did a share market game. I see some of your other interviewees did something similar in about grade 9 or 10. But that, that was really the only exposure I had had to the markets. I didn't know it exist. 
What triggered the initial change, um, I'll try to make this quick, but uh, a guy came into the pilot's crew room one day, one of the other pilots, and he said, guys, I have a plan, we're all going to get rich. And it was he laid out a uh, roulette strategy. It's essentially, it's a really simple one, it's called a martingale approach. You just put all your money on one of the colours, let's say black, and if it loses, you then double your uh, your bet, and you keep doubling until it wins, and at that point, you've, uh, you've won back all your losses and got your initial stake back. And uh, so we were like, no way. We plugged that into Excel, took about five minutes, and just confirmed that theoretically, this works really well. We're going to get rich. But um, it doesn't take much longer to, uh, to look into this and realise that, hey, this is really common. It doesn't work in practice uh, because you reach uh, psychological limits for the size of the bet. You reach uh, limits of your bank and also the casino limits the table. So it was a real high and then a quick back downer and back to work for us all. But uh, that planted a seed for me. And it led to just a really dumb decision that, uh, hey, the way for me to get out of work was to become a professional gambler. And so I just immersed myself for about two years into study of uh, money management and uh, staking plans for roulette, blackjack, and a lot of time in horse racing. I was, you know, this industry we have in trading where, uh, yeah, the systems industry and the indicators, uh, and you go on the forums and it's like, buy when the moving average crosses the other moving average and RSI is rising and etc etc there's a whole industry like that in horse racing as well uh, you can buy systems and strategies and uh, I spent a fortune on those sort of things I actually talked a friend of mine into going halves in a two and a half thousand dollar black box horse racing system uh, of course that didn't work thankfully he's still a friend but uh, yeah so for about two years I just immersed myself in every piece of spare time I had was like in, in gambling um, if I had been smart, I would have looked at poker, which is the only one that sort of really offers a good sustainable edge if you've got the skill. But uh, I wasn't smart. That looked like too much work. I was chasing systems approaches. So, uh, But around year 2000, somehow this then led to seeing the financial markets. And uh, um, I guess it offers kind of a legitimacy that the other forms of gambling don't have. So that attracted me as well. And I hit the books and I hit the charts and uh, got started then in 2000. So it was about a two-year process from first realizing, I hate my job, I've got to get out to when here I am, this is what I want to do, I've found the markets. Okay, so when you went down that path of you found the markets, you want to learn more, what were some of the first sort of things you started to learn about it? Yeah, very first things I did was hit the books. Um, with my background, I have a computer science degree from university. Uh, there's a lot of study uh, required for, for the flying um, that I did as well. So I, I'm really comfortable with the process of uh, self-directed education. And so I hit the books. Uh, a lot less books available back then than there are now. But, um, you know, I, I went out to the shop, bought everything I could get and uh, just sat down and just immersed myself in them. Um, got, got a trading platform, charting platform, and got started. Um, it was probably about a six-month period of just solid immersion before doing my first real trade. So there was a process of, of learning, of growth and development there. Okay, and what sort of level of success did you experience fairly early on? <laughs> yeah, um, you hear a lot of people have stories where they got massive success initially before crashing uh, or, or massive failure initially. I didn't get either. It kind of just ground out results around break even, which is very frustrating um, and, and quite lucky, to be honest. I mean, this, this was, you know, we're talking sort of 2000. 2001, 2002, the first couple of years of my trading. And you look at the charts there, I was trading stocks on uh, a weekly time frame, if you can believe that. Um, but uh, yeah, the stock markets then, 2001, 2002, it's all going backwards. It's all massive bear market. Uh, and yet, I was still able to grind out uh, round break even results. And to be honest, that, that was nothing to do with my skill. I just lucked upon a really good uh, strategy. It was. Um, uh, which I traded with some slight variation, but uh, a guy named Alan Hull had a book, uh, Active Investing, uh, which is still around in new, published new editions since then. But um, it's, it's just a really simple approach to the stock market, which uh, the real strength of that is it identifies really strong and stable trends. So despite the fact I was long only and just buying into a bear market uh, and getting losses, you'd get the occasional win as well, which would just keep the results around break even. 
um, had I been smart enough to continue that from 2003 onwards in the uh, the bull market that went for about the next five or so years, uh, probably would have kicked some serious butt. But unfortunately, I'd moved on before then to options trading. So uh, the, the problem I had uh, was was more so than just wrong market environment for strategy, but uh, it, it was the wrong time frame for me. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face in the beginning is finding our niche in the markets in terms of time frame and strategy and the right market, something that fits our personality and our lifestyle. And uh, the, the longer time frame equity stuff just does not suit my sort of you know, control freak personality. I, I just I hate overnight risk where I'm not there watching it to control it. Okay, so is that what you would say was probably your biggest challenge when starting out was trying to sort of find the right time frame that fits your personality? or was there something else as well that you sort of struggled with? Yeah, initially, I mean, you, you know, I thought it was a pretty smart guy. So um, I thought, hey, this looks easy. Uh, you know, you look at the charts and they show you a moving average cross. You know, how hard does that look? It's, it's really simple. So I thought I was a smart guy and I'd have this sussed out and uh, be making money in a few months. But, uh, of course, it doesn't work out that way. And uh, so a couple of years of break-even results was pretty frustrating. So I had trouble there. Uh, mindset issues, of course, was massive. Um, I guess we'll talk about that at some stage later. But, uh, yeah, really the – oh, and, of course, failing to recognize that a strategy should suit the environment um, and, you know, trying to trade long into a bear market all the time uh, was not necessarily the best. But, yeah, absolutely. The biggest challenge for me was the time frames I was trading did not match – me that did not suit my personality they did not suit my lifestyle and uh so they're just wrong and uh, it, it takes it took me like a six-year process to get from equities on weekly time frames down to forex and futures markets on really short time frames to find this place where i thought yes this this, this suits me this is where i belong it's where i fit uh, it's where I can feel the market as it moves and understand what it's doing. So I think that's something we don't discuss much in the industry. Is people need to go through this process of trial and error, I think, initially. If we spent maybe the first six months of our career just immersing ourselves in different time frames and different markets and different strategies and just playing on demos just to, to find what fits our lifestyle, um, yeah, you, you just if you're trying to fit something that's wrong for you, into your life, it just won't work and you'll underperform um, and it'll just be a frustrating result. So you need to go through that trial and error. I didn't realize that initially, so it took a lot longer than it should have. Yeah, so how long would you say that trial and error period took you until you were sort of somewhat consistent uh, with your profits and you started to feel like you had a good handle on your trading? Yeah, it's uh, well, the initial two years, as I said, was, was kind of break-even stuff. I moved then in... Uh, when was it? it was probably early 2003 across to the options market um part of that was was i recognized that was maybe more suited to me uh in that it's a little more action uh being a bit more leveraged um and i got some i had a change of strategy as well going to more of a pattern breakout uh, price action type strategy i got some okay success with that and you know at the time back then once again i thought man i'm good at this this is fantastic because i was getting some good results but i'd get some periods of not so good results as well i kind of thought i had it then i kind of thought i had it worked out and i just had to iron out a few of the kinks uh but yeah you know, i was wrong again that that was that was options on a daily time frame um, options on Australian equities. Uh, so once again, being a daily time frame, it, it's not a good match for my mindset. If you're waking up in the morning freaking about what happened in the US markets overnight, how's that going to affect my uh, my open option positions? It's it's yeah, it's not a way I like to live. Uh, where I am now, uh, if I'm not in a trade, if I'm not watching the screen, I'm not in a trade. Um, everything right now as we interview, I'm sitting on the side in cash. So there's no stress, and that's how I need to operate. So it took me. To answer your question, about you know, three years, sometime late 2003, I thought I had it all sussed. I thought I was a good trader, and that's where I, yeah, I was wrong. But um, that's about how long it took. The Ultimately, though, to get to the stage where I thought I knew what I was doing, and it turns out I did, it took about six years. So I don't know if that's typical of most people. I see some who can do it in months. I see some take about three years. Uh, I see people who have you know, been going for a decade or longer and still not there. So uh, I guess it's an individual journey. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's some really great points you touched on there. So 
During that time, was there ever a point when you felt like you weren't going to make it as a trader? Um, I believe you hit a, a rough patch around 2004. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I didn't, I couldn't say that I ever thought I wasn't going to make it, but I, I hit absolute bottom in 2004. Um, combination of good results through 2003, making me think I was better than I was. Um, perhaps, yeah, the auction strategies. There was some uh, some auction selling, uh, covered calls, uh, credit spreads and things, but mostly it was just buying uh, puts or calls, mostly calls because it was a bear market. So I think part of the good results was just I was in a suitable market for the strategy. But 2004 um, was a real low point. Uh, not so much the trading. It was that combined with other factors. Uh, two years prior, we'd sold our house and we'd moved to get involved in another business opportunity. It's not trading related. We don't need to get into that. But uh, things went really sour with that. And we essentially, uh, 2004, lost everything we had. Uh, so it's myself, my wife, two kids. They're about five years old at that stage. Um, and so I was... Yeah, mindset-wise, in a really bad place. Um, you know, you meant to provide for your family, and I clearly was not doing that. And I thought, you know, 2003, I had some good results with trading. I will trade myself out of this hole. And that is just the dumbest thing you can ever do. Um, and, and so I just uh, – I, I scrapped everything else out of my life so that I could just focus on trading and just immerse myself in that. But it didn't go well. I wasn't in the right mindset. There was too much pressure to uh, to put food on the table for the family. And so, you know, the trading was dumb. The trading decisions were really dumb. Uh, I even took some of the money and put it into another brokerage account with a full service broker so that I, you know, I'd call them up and said, man, give me some tips. Give me, you know, <laughs> give me some options trades. And that is really dumb as well. That's just the, the worst thing. Uh, you know, looking back after that with hindsight some of his uh, trades were very good but uh, I wasn't in the right place to manage them appropriately so 2004 was tough it took only a couple of months to realize this is not working the family situation is getting desperate uh, we're in debt uh, I need to go back to work and sort my stuff out sort myself out so there was probably a six month period there where I didn't really trade I still sort of followed the markets a little but I, I really just dropped back just a, a tactical withdrawal uh, regroup re reset myself up better to, uh, to launch again and uh, what that involved I mean the second time I went full time 2006 we were structured a lot better there. I'd set myself up so that um, I had income on the side that uh, was sufficient to cover just, but sufficient to cover all our living expenses. And I think that's so important when you, you, you're planning to go live. You, you get a lot of people giving advice that, you know, before you go live, save up six months of income so that you, you can just focus for six months or so, or so. But what if it takes you eight months to get it? So you, you've just run out of money and you're back at your job that you hate. So I think a better plan is structure your life some way to get some other income streams, whether that's, you know, maybe if you can survive off your partner's income, that's fantastic. But if not, you know, just get some part-time work or some consultancy or, or something such that uh, and and fit trading around that so that uh and, and that's essentially what i did so 2006 i was back full time um but with the income covered if i made nothing of trading that's cool yeah we're surviving so uh yeah 2004 was really bad 2005 was was just hell that's where i just got so lost and off track with uh yeah stuck in indicators and systems and all of that sort of stuff um i don't know when it was late 2005 early 2006 is when i just said enough with that get rid of all these indicators, get rid of all of the systems. I had some success earlier with price action, basic price action stuff. Let's go back to first principles. And, you know, I, I sat with a chart, just a naked chart, and it's like, what is price? What causes price to move? Uh, how do I see that early in the price move rather than waiting for lots of confirmation? And how do I profit? And by just taking everything back to first principles uh, and starting again, with the uh, background knowledge and skill and experience that I had, things fell in place pretty quickly then uh, in a matter of months. Yeah, I really like that about how you talked about um, having a side income to sort of take the pressure off yourself to actually sort of be making money every day or every week sort of thing. Um, that's a really good point. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about 
your actual trading and your approach. So um, how would you best describe your approach to trading? All right. Um, best describe it. I'm a short time frame, a technical discretionary trader. So short time frame, I'm operating on a trading time frame of uh, one minute charts at the moment. Um, uh, that's the trading time frame. Technical, meaning it, it's essentially just price action only. There's uh, very little indicator use. Uh, I do have volume on the charts, but that plays a very small part as well. It's essentially price action. And discretionary in that um, there is some discretion involved. There is some subjectivity. It's not a fixed rule-based system. I'm, I, I don't believe that works, at least not the way retail traders apply them. But uh, And so basically, if you look at my screens, there is a, it's a three time frame approach. There's a higher time frame, which for me is the five minute chart that provides the structure to the market through a support and resistance framework. There's the trading time frame, which is the one minute chart. And that's where I'm you know, following the price actions that flows within the higher time frame structure. So looking at the trend uh, and looking within that trend for areas of trade opportunity. And then there's a lower time frame. Uh, I actually operate with two of them right now. There's a 15 second chart and a two range chart. They both give a different perspective, but the lower time frame is just for fine tuning that trading time frame analysis and for just timing the uh, the entry and exit. Um, so the three charts there, and I operate. There's really only uh, five trade areas if you want to sort of summarize them all. Um, I'm operating three of them on price interaction with support and resistance levels. So it's standard swing trading stuff. There's uh, breakout failures, uh, there's tests of the support and resistance that haven't quite broken, and breakout pullbacks when it is a successful break. And then within the structure between the SR levels, I'm looking at uh, different kinds of pullbacks within the trend, just being a simple pullback or a complex pullback. So that's essentially how I would describe it. Short time frame, technical discretionary price action trader. Um, beyond that, I go a little different in how I sort of look at price compared with most price action traders in that we get into, um, I, I guess you saw that looking through my blog. I'm not really a pattern trader, but more of a uh, looking at the internal nature of price, the strength and weakness of how the price swings uh, show on the chart and uh, also metagame aspects. Um, do you want me to get into that? Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right, how do we do this? Um, the, the ultimate aim of my approach is to identify, if I want to simplify it, a short-term bias for market movement. Okay, so price, is it, okay, the, the next two or three price swings going to be bullish or are they going to be bearish? Okay, and then we're looking for a price movement against that bias. So I'm looking at people pushing the price against that bias. Now, as I'm looking at that pullback against bias to try and time my entry, I'm not looking from a pattern perspective. I'm looking from two alternate perspectives. The first is the nature of how price is moving. Um, is it pulling back? If we take an uptrend, for example, is the bearish pullback sort of occurring with bearish strength or is it weak? And I'm really looking to fade weak. If it pulls back with strength, that's information I wasn't expecting. I'm standing aside and waiting. Um, so I'm looking at the internal strength and weakness of the, uh, the the pullbacks. But I'm also looking at a metagame perspective. And this is the, the people perspective. I'm really trying to get in the mindset of the people who are trading that pullback. Um, who's getting trapped? Who's in a losing position? When are they feeling fear? When are they you know, praying to the market gods that, come on, please, just once, give me a winning trade? And I'm trying to feel that fear. And I use that to time my entry. Basically, I'm looking to uh, identify the point where these people know they've got it absolutely wrong and then profit from their exit order flow by entering at or before that point of their failure. So while I'm a price action trader, it's a little different to most. I'm not looking at heads and shoulder patterns and triangles, etc., etc. It's really uh, looking at the internal way that price is moving and the people aspect. Um, the idea... Metagame, metagaming for people not familiar with that term. It's really, uh, to put it simply, it's just the game hidden behind the game. And uh, for me, most people are stuck in the game of price. Just they look at price moving and uh, they're, they're trying to identify when do we buy, when do we sell based on these chart patterns. And uh, for me, I recognize that that's not actually the real game because the, the price itself and the price movement comes from 
uh, order flow, and that order flow comes from traders making trading decisions. So in trying to identify the cause of a price move, you really need to be getting down into sort of analysing um, what the traders are thinking who are making these price patterns occur. Uh, and so that's the meta game. That's where I operate in timing my trades. Yeah, and I think that that ties in very well with something I read on your site uh, yesterday, actually, and you mentioned the aim of analysis is to identify where you know others will buy after you and identify where others will sell after you. Yeah, absolutely correct. And, and you know, that, that's the metagame approach. And um, uh, actually, I think the article that comes from was the rock, paper, scissors one. Is that correct? Quite possibly. Yeah, the, the rock, paper, scissors is a good analogy for, for what a metagame is. And uh, there's, there's, there's a Simpsons episode, which I, I mentioned in that article, where um, Bart and Lisa, are, uh, they're disagreeing over something. And so Lisa says, well, Bart, there's only one way we can solve this, and that's rock, paper, scissors. And then they go to Lisa's thoughts process, and she's thinking, poor, predictable Bart always chooses rock. And Bart is thinking, good old rock, rock never fails. So he throws rock, Lisa throws paper, Lisa wins. Ro- uh, Lisa were there, was playing the metagame. She's not playing the rules of uh, rock, paper, scissors, which is basically that, uh, hey, it's all random. You've got a one out of, you've got a 30% chance of uh, winning, 33% chance of losing, 33% chance of draw. She is actually playing the game of um, thinking, getting inside the thought processes of her opponent and using that to her advantage. And that's what I'm trying to do in the charts. When you break it down to first principles and go back to sort of what is price, how does price move, what causes price to move, and I think that was a critical part in my development when I actually stopped to look at cause and effect, um, I realised that uh, it's all trader decisions and it doesn't matter what technical patterns or indicators you use for entry. If you buy in the market and no one buys after you, they're not going to drive price further. Uh, So you lose. So really the game comes down to sort of identifying the places on the chart where you know people are going to buy that after you. You're getting in before them. Um, or if you're short, people are going to sell after you have already sold. And that is essential for driving price in your direction. It's essential for profit. And uh, so if, I think if you're not looking at the market from that perspective, you're doing yourself a disservice. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially it. Yeah, that's really good. I like that, um, that analogy there. So we'll try and dig that article up and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Cool, yeah. Um, <laughs> I th- yeah I've done like 380 articles on that site and uh, of them, that's my favorite by far. Nice. So what sort of markets um, are you mainly sort of trading in? Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. Like you know, the, the evolution of my trading over the, uh, the, the, what are we, 15 years now. Um, gone from equities on a weekly time frame down to uh, equities on daily, options on daily time frame, down to uh, CFDs on daily time frame. There's contracts for difference. Uh, across to Forex on 15-minute charts, Forex and five-minute charts. So it's a gradual process of getting shorter and shorter. Uh, then to, where were we, 2009, we went to futures, uh, dropped down to three-minute charts, uh, and then futures on the one-minute chart. And I'm really comfortable where I am now and absolutely loving it. Um, so the primary market I trade right now is crude oil markets, uh, crude oil futures market, um, with a little bit of dabbling in the uh, the E-minis as well, sort of uh, E-mini Dow or uh, E-mini Russell. Uh, I would absolutely love to trade the S&P, but I just cannot get in sync with that. It's just a slow, frustrating, boring market. I kind of need directional stuff that's got a bit of action and a bit of feedback on uh, how the market's moving. And so you know, I go for the more directional ones, uh, crude oil, um, and Emily Russell are just perfect. Unfortunately, there's nothing in my time zone uh, for that. I'm, I'm living same same as you, Aaron, living on the east coast of Australia, which is just yeah, it's got to be the most awesome place to live on the planet, uh, unless you're a trader. Uh, and so for me, um, my my trading work starts pretty late. I'm almost permanently night shift, uh, which is not good at all. Uh, actually, yesterday I was happiest guy on the planet because US Daylight Savings kicked off and uh, means my training session starts at 11 p.m. rather than midnight. So that was cool. Oh, nice. Very good. <laughs> yeah. It's only an hour, but it makes a big difference. It does, yeah. From what I gather, you like to keep your your stops fairly tight on your positions but you've also got no problem re-entering a trade if you get bumped out. 
Um, and you mentioned many people struggle with this. So where do you draw the line about sort of how many attempts and losses you're generally willing to take before you step aside and just let the trade go? Yeah, cool. Um, that's absolutely correct. I am, you know, one of my things, I'm, I'm very risk averse um, or risk aware perhaps is the, the more, the, the better term. Um, I hate big losses. So I keep the stop loss very tight and I keep small position sizing. And um, I recognize that I get emails every week from people going, oh my God, this trade stopped out before it went on without me. And uh, where did I go wrong? And it's like, you, you didn't go wrong. It's just, you know, do you seriously expect that every entry will be perfect and it's going to move to profits uh, straight from, from the go? Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, we're imperfect people just operating in an environment of uncertainty. And so there is some, you know, you're going to get some drawdown. So I, there's two ways to approach that. You know, you, perhaps some people are better just with wider stops. Uh, that doesn't work for me, doesn't work for my mindset. So I prefer uh, to operate very tight stops where I'm controlling this this, this risk. I'm, I'm entering at the point where I believe it should go very quickly in my favour. And if the trade's going to work, it usually does. But, uh, but I'm also then managing. If it doesn't do that, I, I'm very quickly like... I'm very comfortable scratching and uh, getting out on the sidelines and reassessing. Um, easy to reassess with no exposure on the sidelines and look at the trade. And, you know, I'll get back in if I think, you know, the premise is still valid. Um, influenced by a few people in that regard who, Mike Reed from Tradestalker.com was just, was just brilliant. He really put the final touches on my, the way I operate with regards to risk and with an active trade management strategy. Um, Larry Williams was good as well. He, he says in some of his books that uh, when he enters his trades, he expects every time that that's going to be a loser and he manages it appropriately. So it's a really aggressive way of controlling that risk. When I get in a trade, it's going to move in my favor really quick otherwise I'm going to reassess uh, whether that's just scale out a little take partial profits and reassess or scale fully out and reassess um, will depend on the circumstances but uh, yeah I'm quite comfortable uh, scratching a trade and reassess and get back in I'm quite comfortable as well because of small position sizing to take that first loss uh, if it does go fully against me and then reassess and get back in and I think it's not easy. It takes uh, exposure to it to get on a sim and just practice and play with it, but reduce position sizes as well. And, and I think, um, you know, people will, will know pretty quick whether that style suits them or whether they need the wider stops. But, uh, you know, it suits me and I'm quite comfortable uh, uh, getting a scratch or two and re-entering, scratch again, re-enter, or uh, even a full loss. Now, um, I think you, you, you asked at what point do I go enough is enough, I'm wrong. Uh, really, if, if I hit two full-size losses in one setup area, I'm not in flow with the market. I'm not reading it well. And that's when I will really step back and uh, usually just yeah, let that one go and uh, we'll wait for a totally new setup area. Uh, I mean, on one minute's time frame, they come along quick enough anyway. So sometimes you get it wrong. And uh, rather than trapping the other traders in a losing position, I find I'm the one getting trapped. And uh, yeah, you just let that go. It's part of the game. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's a problem a lot of new traders have is their relationship with risk or with loss. Uh, and this takes time and exposure to markets. Um, yeah, everyone, they understand the probabilistic nature of this game that you're know, not every trade is going to win and that if you've got, say, a 55% win rate that you're going to get a hell of a lot of losers as well and yet their actions don't show that they really get that you know they're emailing saying oh this one lost where did it go wrong and it's like well where you went wrong is you didn't get back in after you got stopped out so you know it's it's not the only way to trade it's just how i do it it's it's what fits me really well yeah i think you said that really well so i appreciate you breaking that down lance um one of the other things, I'm sort of just going to quote this from the website, and, and you said the real damage is often psychological and not financial. So what do you mean by this statement? Yeah, I don't recall where that was written or the context, but you know, essentially I think any uh, extended losses or extended drawdown that we do, the, the real damage is to your mindset because you're, you're losing your, your, your confidence, uh, you're losing your belief in yourself, your belief in yourself to make money in this game. Um, the money 
doesn't matter so much. I mean, if, if someone with no cash could... Yeah. <laughs> If you can trade, you will find the money. Others will provide it if necessary. Um, so the, the money is not a big deal. For me, it's all mindset. Um, you don't want to damage your mindset. You've got to nurture that and protect it. So th- th- that's part of why I trade quite aggressively with the uh, the risk management, at least in the early parts of the trade, uh, because I don't want those large drawdowns. So uh, very risk averse, and you know, I manage my losses. Uh, the profits take care of themselves largely. Um, so I guess that's it. You know, look after your mindset. If, if you damage that, it's game over. It's, it's, you look at people who have uh, lost all confidence and they've got to step back and take a couple of months out of the markets and uh, reevaluate whether this is the right thing for them. And uh, if, if it is, they come back and you've got to start again. But starting again is so hard. Like after the 2004 experience, just getting back into the market was, was just incredibly difficult because every trade um, – yeah, it was fear. It's not about the loss of money. Every trade, you know, I'm putting my whole future and my wife and my kids' future on the line and gambling it. Um, it's you've got to have a clear mind and you've got to have self belief. So protect that more than the money. Yeah, it's a it's a big responsibility, especially when you you put it in perspective like that. Yeah, like, I so wish I got into this game as a young guy, sort of you know before family and everything. But uh, you know, it would be so much easier. But it wasn't to be. You know, we all have our own path. Uh, but uh, yeah, look, protect your money, but more than that, protect your mindset. Yeah, no doubt. So, um, how extensively do you record and sort of reevaluate your trades uh, maybe from the past day or week or, or have you do that? Yeah, um, this has changed over the years, but it is fairly extensive and it frustrates people because I say, you know, here's the process I use for my uh, pre-session uh, preparation, here's the process I use for my post-session review and you get people say, I can't fit that into my life and <laughs> it's too much uh, and that's fine, you do what you can, but um, yeah, I do review the session, uh, I review the session from a structural perspective, you know, did, did I assess it right in terms of ranging or trending, did I pick the transition from one to the other, uh, I also review the trades, now there was a time when I was longer time frames, I'd review every trade, uh, when you're in a one minute time frame, if you get, say, you know, a dozen trades in, in I'm trading a three-hour session at the moment, but if you pick up 10 or 12 trades in that session, I don't have time to go through them all, except for just uh, a cursory glance, you know, what was that a valid trade? Did I pick the structure correctly? Did I... Um, and did I time the entry in good wholesale areas? Um, the only ones I'll look at in depth now, uh, because there's so many trades, are those I assess that significantly underperformed what uh, was available, or those that significantly outperformed. You know, you sometimes get market conditions where you know I had no right taking a profit out of that, but I did. So I'll look at that and see what I did, uh, trying to get the lessons out of that. So really looking at trades, uh, those that underperformed, those that outperformed. Those that were just like a eh, normal trade, uh, I'll let them go now. Um, in terms of tracking, uh, I used to track stats for every trade. Uh, a few years back, I went off that and moved to a different approach where I was just tracking daily stats, uh, just looking at daily uh, results, uh, win percentage, win loss, size ratio. I did that for a while. I'm now back to sort of tracking every trade. I mean, it's pretty simple when you, your platform gives you a spreadsheet. Uh, you can export all your trades and you can just plug it straight into your uh, your trading spreadsheet. Uh, so I put all trades, but I monitor them from a group perspective. Um, what, what I think, actually I'm getting a little off track here, but I think a good exercise for people to do is to start tracking their trades in small groups. Um, I was speaking or chatting by email with a trader yesterday who was uh, was talking about his long-term stats that he's got, uh, I won't give his win percent, but, you know, let's say 55% win rate across the last 1,000 trades or so. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of people track their business in that way, and I think such a long time frame perspective there it does them a bit of disservice because you don't get any sort of indication as to short-term current performance levels. And so what I recommend people do is... Uh, track their results in small groups, whether that's uh, you know, 20 trades um, or 50 trades or 100 trades uh, or just weekly results. But um, look at your business reviews from the perspective of your group results rather than individual trade results. Um, 
you know, sort of, you know, for each group, let's say 20 trades, what's the, you know, we're tracking the win percentage and the win-loss size ratio of that group. Um, and looking at the, you know, what runs of winners did we get, what runs of losers, what's the largest winner, largest loser, etc. So you're looking at group results rather than individual results, individual trades, and rather than uh, long, decade-long thousand trade results. And by looking at small groups, they come around often enough that you get some context that you can examine them against. You're looking to compare that 20 trade grouping against um, your expectations of what you should normally get across 20 trades, and you're looking to compare it against previous groups to look at some degree of consistency. And so that way, you'll pretty quickly see if you're going off track and current sort of performance is is deviating from uh, recent performance in, in, in quite a way. So I think it's a bit off track there. But to answer your question, yeah, I'm pretty thorough. I do a lot of – I do hours each day of uh, review and uh, preparation. Yeah, I really like that idea how you sort of explained it of grouping your trades together. Um, I think that's really cool and, you know, obviously quite important. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's something that just – Everyone gets it. Everyone understands it when I say it. But uh, yeah, they're not doing it, and they're still looking from an individual trade perspective. And uh, yeah, your individual trades don't matter. Uh, if you're comfortable with the risk and you're appropriately position size, you should take a loss without any stress. If you've taken just a single one hour loss, uh, you know, one times risk. It shouldn't be any drama. If that's causing you stress, you're trading with too much position size, so cut it back a bit. Uh, but you need to be not looking, not concerned so much with individual results, but looking at group results. It's a very different game if I say, Aaron, you've got a profit on this next trade. That's very different from, Aaron, show me a profit over the next 20 trades. You know, suddenly, a single loss is not so much of a big deal, and you're looking to sort of you know, manage your wins and losses to get, uh, you, know, you might just get 50 50% of them right, 50% wrong, but you're looking to sort of develop your win-loss size ratio so that that gives you a positive expectancy over 20 trades. And by taking that 20 trade perspective rather than individual trade, it's a very different game and I think much better for the mindset. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks for again for, for really breaking that down. That's awesome. Um, this is probably one of my favorite questions to ask and that is, from your experience, what is that? What is it that you believe prevents the majority of traders from ever reaching a high level of success? <laughs> Man, there's just so many things. Um, yeah, the first one we've just been talking about is their relationship with loss. Okay, people come from different backgrounds and jobs and whatever where income is pretty secure. In yeah, in this game, yeah, you, you eat what you kill is what they say. If you don't perform today and get some kills, you don't eat. You don't get money. Uh, so it's a, it's a performance activity, but uh, it's one in an environment of uncertainty. So you need to expect losses. You need to learn how to. That's just part of the game and manage them. And that is something that people don't get and you can't get until you've got experience. So it takes time. But, uh, you know, what, what else are people doing wrong? They, they don't have a proper process of growth and development. They're looking at this game, a lot of people, not all, but a lot of them are looking at it from a systems perspective. Uh, and, and that's why there's a whole industry geared around this because it makes a, the easiest way to make a million bucks in trading, I reckon, is to sell systems. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a whole industry geared around it. Uh, and the forums are just filled with systems full of, you know, mediocre advice and failed traders just sharing their systems. And so they get stuck in the systems mindset. And, you know, I make fun of it, but that's where I was for many years with the gambling stuff. And it's where I was early days with trading as well. So I've been there. We've all been there. Uh, so, yeah, they're looking at it as a systems game instead of one of a process of growth and development. Um, there's been a lot of good material. A lot of people write about this. Uh, SMB Capital write about it. Mike Bellafiore quite a bit about deliberate practice and uh, uh, effective methods of growth and development. Uh, so I think that's important. They're approaching it from the wrong perspective. Um, I think as well, you know, by looking for that shortcut, people just aren't immersing themselves in the game, in the study of price action. They're not building um, a great term I heard the other week was deep domain knowledge. So you've got to hit the books and study this game and you've got to hit the charts and all the answers, everything you need is in the charts. They've got to get in there and study them. Uh, and so I think people just aren't using the right process uh, for learning. They're, they're looking for the, the quick buck, the systems, and not treating it as a process of skill development. So that's probably the main thing. 
But there's heaps more. There's heaps more traps and uh, shortcuts. It's not an easy game. <laughs> no, no, you're right there. It's it's a very tough game. But um, let's let's move along into the closing bell. So this is just a few questions which will take us out. And these are fairly generic. I ask them to you know most of the guests. So the first one is there one piece of advice that has really stuck with you ever since you originally heard it or perhaps read it somewhere? Yeah, cool. Um, one piece of advice, probably uh, forgive yourself again and again and again because you are going to stuff this game up big time uh, over and over again and it's going to be frustrating. So you, you, you need to... You need to take time out just to laugh at yourself and the stupid things you do and just forgive yourself and learn from it and move on. So, yeah, if people could just forgive themselves a bit more than they do, <laughs> it would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so you mentioned uh, sort of getting involved in books throughout the interview. So is there one book that you strongly recommend uh, as a must-read for any new to intermediate trader? Uh, not one book. Uh, not beginner either. Uh, if we go technical analysis, let me put a few in different categories. Uh, technical analysis, more for the intermediate rather than beginner. Go for um, the art and science of technical analysis, analysis by uh, Adam Grimes. Uh, trading psychology, which is massive field, um, absolutely love it. Uh, read everything by Brett Steenbeier, all of his books. Uh, same with Steve Ward. Uh, for a general read, just general trading stuff. Just looking at my bookshelf here. Um, uh, Mike Bellafiore, who I mentioned before from SMB Capital, uh, has two great books, One Good Trade and The Playbook. So you've got to read those. There, there are probably so many others, but actually the, the one best book is not one that you get from the bookstore or Amazon.com, but one that you make yourself, and that's uh, something I talk quite a bit about on the website, is a market structure and price action journal. So get a folder every day, print out the charts from the session, and go through and examine the structure. Look at, uh, was it ranging? Was it trending? Uh, how could you have picked that early in the range or the trend? What price action features show that that was the structure of the market? Uh, look at the transition from one structural uh, environment to another as well. Um, look at the price action. How does it how does it move as it interacts with support and resistance? How does it move when it uh, is overextended to the upside or downside? Uh, how does it move when it pulls back to the day's opening range? Yeah. So build your own book, your own market structure, price action journal, a uh, couple of chart printouts every day. It takes maybe 10 minutes uh, and it's just invaluable. You know, do that over the next year and you'll thank me. You're going to have just a, a, a massive resource that's a hell of a lot better than any book you're going to buy. So if it's one book, market structure journal, make it yourself. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw you wrote about that quite extensively on your website. So again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and, and anyone who's interested can check it out. I, I do, but you know, it's amazing. So, you know, people sort of contact me and they're struggling and it's like, well, you show me your market structure journal. It's like, oh, I don't do that. It's like, well, come on. You know, I've, I've been beating my head here against the wall for like last five or six years writing about this stuff. And yeah, you, you've just got to do it. It's just so important. So in terms of immersing yourself in price action, there, there's nothing better uh, than, than a daily review of structure and the price and how it moves and uh, ongoing reviews. You know, do it on OneNote or Evernote if you prefer. But, you know, I've tried that. didn't work for me. I don't make use of it. I don't refer back to it. So it's hard copy folders. Okay. And knowing everything you do now, is there anything you would have done differently come day one again to shorten your learning curve? Ooh, two ways I could answer that. One is to say no, absolutely nothing difficult because all the struggle has led to exactly who I am now and I'm pretty comfortable with where I am right now. So let's go through those struggles again. But uh, I guess if I had to say a few things, um, I'd like to, if I could go back and talk to myself 15 years ago, it would be more patient. Do not go full time until I have other income streams set in place to cover all living expenses. Uh, and forget the indicators, start with basic principles. What is price? How does it move? How do we profit from that movement? How do we identify the cause of the price movement on a chart in real time? How do I identify traders who are trapped and struggling and stressed out and fearful? Um, and just immerse myself in the 
chart. The answer's in the charts. Everything is in the charts that you need, Aaron. It's not on a forum or in a book. Um, and the other thing is get into trading psychology. Read up more on that. I've got uh, trading psychology is a massive part of my game. Just keeping in the right mindset, uh, keeping in the right state, and keeping focus on process. So, so get into the the mindset side of the game more. All right, awesome. Well, um, that pretty much brings us to the end of the interview, and I, I must give a special mention to Jonathan who put me onto you <laughs> and uh, introduced me to your site. Um, Jonathan suggested I try to get you on for an interview and I'm pleased he did because your answers have been outstanding. So so thanks again for coming on. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Jonathan. And to learn more about Lance, make sure you go and check out his website. It's yourtradingcoach.com. Yeah, come to the site, check it out, yourtradingcoach.com. It's mostly just a, a an archive for all my blog articles and posts. So it's years and years of them. It's just crazy. So come and check it out if you like it. Uh, sign up and you can get them each week. If you don't like it, that's cool. Good luck with your journey. But uh, also uh, Facebook, yourtradingcoach.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, YTC Trading, uh, or also uh, at Lance Beggs. Uh, you should find me pretty easy. Very good. All right. Well, all those links will be in the show notes. And um, this has been awesome again, Lance. So thanks a lot for coming on. And uh, take care and we'll speak to you soon. Cool. Thanks, Aaron. It's great to be here, man. If anyone has any questions, I, I believe there is a comment section on your page that you post this. So put them in there. I'll monitor that for a few weeks and uh, be sure to answer anything if anyone has questions. Absolutely. So yeah, just go to chatwithtraders.com. You'll find Lance's episode there. And um, if you just scroll down to the bottom, there will be a comment section. So, yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for offering that up, Lance. That's really good. Awesome. Thanks, man. It's been great. All right. Talk soon. Cool. Bye. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But don't worry. More great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. And we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.